Welcome to the Orthodontics and Summary Podcast, where Farouk brings you the key points and understanding of orthodontic webinars, conferences, and papers in a concise podcast with your host, Farouk Ahmed. Welcome to this episode of Orthodontics in Summary. Today is the second part of our series of lectures by Dalia El Bokal, looking at bonding for an exquisite finish. In this lecture, the focus is on a step-by-step guide to indirect bonding. Dahlia talks about the advantages of indirect bonding versus direct bonding. She describes how it saves her clinical time through not having as many repositions and why bending to do. So how does the process work? Well, in summary, there is a set of study models to which the brackets are bonded on, followed by an indirect tray which is made, followed by a transfer into the patient clinically. So what's the first stage? Well, the first stage is marking the ideal position for the brackets to be positioned. Now, Dali described this in some detail in part one of this series of lectures. But to go over it again, the premise is of using the ideal intersection of the horizontal and vertical lines. So for this, Dali starts off with the posterior teeth. The vertical line is a long axis and she uses an OPG or combium CT to help work out the ideal vertical position of this tooth followed by the horizontal lines. Now for the posterior, there are two lines which are drawn. The first is the outcome of treatment that we desire, which is to have the marginal ridge height in an ideal position. And this to recap is the incisal aspect of the marginal ridge contact. The next is the slot line, which is usually drawn one to two millimeters higher or gingival. This depends upon the bracket itself. So she starts off with the first molar. She identifies the tip of the tooth then she finds where the actual marginal ridge height lies. From that, she puts the slot line, and therefore she has the ratio of the slot line to the marginal ridge height, and simply transfers this to the rest of the posterior teeth. Now, what about the anterior teeth? Well, that's the second thing. The vertical line is done exactly the same way as the posterior teeth, a long axis drawn using an OPG or combium CT. Now the horizontal line now starts with the canine tooth, so we're working from back to front. That's matched up with the first premolar. The slot line is drawn, and then we move on to the lateral incisor. So a bracket gauge is now used to measure the canine tip through to the slot line, and 0.25 millimeters is added to that for the lateral incisor. Essentially, it's more cervical by a fraction. If the lateral incisor is small, Dahlia says she uses the same height as the canine tooth itself. The central incisor has a greater discrepancy of 0.25 to 0.5 millimeters relative to the canine. And this is Dahlia's concept of a customized arch positioning using a subtle Smilock, a concept built on from Tom Pitts and adapted in Dahlia's clinical practice. So now we've marked the intersection between the vertical and horizontal lines. Next is to create the transfer tray. So to do this, Dahlia marks that intersection with a wax knife and then uses tacky glue to stick the brackets to the model. Now tacky glue is a water-soluble adhesive which will come off as we go through the stages and it's a vital component to using it. It takes about 10 minutes to set. This allows Dahlia to then assess both occlusally vertically and the tip of each bracket position. At 10 minutes, she checks that it's stuck on well by digitally trying to push the brackets, ensuring they are in situ. Next, she relieves the areas over the bracket hooks. Now, it was clear when Dahlia was explaining this, she's learned through making mistakes. If the relief isn't present around the hooks, it's a nightmare to take off the transfer tray. She uses wax or tacky glue to cover over the hooks of the brackets. Next is the tray itself. So for this, she uses a vacuum forming machine and her preference is to use a one millimeter soft sheet. She heats up the sheet and pulls it over the model with the brackets in situ. She then assesses things. There's a quality assurance process to it to ensure the brackets haven't moved both vertically and horizontally. Now, because on the model, she's marked where the vertical and horizontal lines are, it's easy to make this visual assessment. She trims the excess material and then soaks it in water for 10 minutes. She washes it using an interdental brush. Now, the priority is to ensure the bracket bases are clean. There's no adhesive. There's no discrepancy of any material. Next, she cuts slit lines 
which go from the cervical aspect of the of the transfer tray through to the cervical aspect of the bracket itself. This is key to allow the exposure of the hooks of the posterior teeth. Otherwise, it can be difficult to remove them and also composite can go underneath them as well. Next is the clinical side effect. So we've got our bonding tray ready. She etches and bonds the surface. She's very careful to make sure it's only where the bracket's going to go. She then uses composite on the bracket base, using a micro brush to cover all the bracket base, the minimal composite required, but also embedding the composite into the bracket base. She then seats the indirect bonding tray. She applies per perpendicular force, pressure to the bracket itself in a horizontal direction to ensure that there is no excess left underneath the bracket. She cures for 20 seconds and removes the tray and then takes away the flash. Now the key point about etching only the necessary surfaces means the flash comes off far more easily. Now it's not always a plain sailing process. Sometimes brackets can come off. Dali says it's easy to correct this. Simply maintain isolation, remove the excess composite, trim the tray to the individual tooth and reinsert the bracket into the transfer tray and insert into the patient's mouth. Now what happens if the brackets are in the incorrect position? Dahlia says this comes down to the technique. It may be a defective impression, the main brackets may have moved during the suck down process of the vacuum formed retainer, or it may, there may be a drag on the initial impression. And these are all things gained through experience of how to avoid. Now she does mention there are disadvantages, and I think it's always key when a speaker describes a proposal for a new idea, but also the downsides of it. She mentioned it does take about an hour to do clinically. There is a cost to it of around $12 if in-house. And there is a technique sensitivity to it, which does take some time to get to grips with. But overall, Dahlia still feels it's worth the time because it saves a clinical time later down the line. Less repositions, less wire bending taking place, and more efficient clinical practice. Hope you guys have enjoyed part two of this lecture series. Look forward to the next week's part three and conclusion of Dahlia's lectures, looking at bonding for an exquisite finish. Hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please do subscribe and look forward to the next episode.